What does it do to the global economy if oil should go to 150, 175, 200 dollars a barrel? Well, it would have a, a pretty dramatic effect on economies the world over, uh, certainly our own, but also economies elsewhere. Thriving economies in China would feel the effects of that uh, because energy is so much a part of all economic And all activity. economies are connected. And all economies are connected. Yeah. I think it's I think it's one of the reasons I, when people make these projections that all could go to those levels, I've never subscribed to a view that they would have, that they would ever reach that. Level. You have no hypothesis that you think might become reality. Only in the event that you take major supplying countries completely out of the, mm -hmm. out of the supply, out of the market. You know, if, if you take, if you take Saudi Arabia off the map, right. that's a problem. What has potential for you? I mean, beyond natural gas, which you've expressed yourself both in terms of your resources and your brain power, mm -hmm. beyond that, where is something that we might not know about that you're keeping your eye on because you think this might be some here? There may be something here. Well, I wouldn't want to exactly characterize it that way, and, and if there was, I probably wouldn't tell you. Yeah, you know, I was uh, worried about the latter, but not the former. But uh, but we do we do follow very closely all of the technology developments in the non oil, natural gas space, uh, because if there are improvements evident at rates faster than we expected, we want to know about that because we do have, we've always felt, we have the financial wherewithal to enter that space any time we choose. So some of the things we have been doing uh, that are not, uh, that people are aware of is we have been uh, researching biofuels uh, from algae, mm -hmm. and we've been researching it from a little bit different perspective than others. Working with a company called Synthetics Genomics Incorporated, right. Right. this these were the people who mapped the human genome, right. because we wanted to investigate with them what what the possibilities around genetically modified algae might might present. And so we've had a collaborative underway with them for some time. Uh, we've we've come to understand some limits of that technology or it limits as we understand it today, which doesn't mean it's limited forever. In fact, I think it has redirected them to go think about some things now because of the joint work we've done. But we've, we've continued that work, moving now to more the fundamental biology around these. And these what's the potential? Well, the, if I were to vision you know, here, here's where if you could solve this problem, which we can't solve today, is if I could develop a strain of algae that I could modify biologically or genetically, and I could cause this algae to want to produce itself very rapidly, and I could cause it to want to take the oils that it produces and rather retain it in the cellular structure, which is what they do today, yeah. and to get it you have to crush the algae and destroy it. Rather, the algae would expel the oil rapidly and it would do this over a cycle and then it would do it in a controlled environment called a reactor in which I would control the environment. I'd build that reactor right in the middle of my refinery and I'd have an algae <laughs> fuel making machine that's pouring off, right into the refinery. Putting off this fuel that looks a lot like diesel by the way when it expels it. Now do you have scientists telling you that's n that, that's a reality that could happen? Uh, we, With enough technology advancement it is a possibility and what we know is we know reactor design that's what we're good at. This is what we build inside our refineries and our chemical plants. What we need is someone who can make an algae for me that will, that'll do what, it'll do yeah. the Tillerson, <laughs> the Tillerson uh, vision of what I want an algae to do, to behave. Yeah. And so that's, that's, you know, that's pretty far out there. And once you perfect it. Pretty far that, out there is what, 25 years? Well, probably further than that. Okay. Th these are very uh, challenging problems because and the reason we engage in them is because we want to understand how high is the hurdle. Not, uh, not necessarily from a threat standpoint, but from an opportunity standpoint. And with the, the work we've done to this point in this particular space, what we've come to understand is the hurdle's pretty high, and the hurdle seems to exist at the basic science level, which means it's even more difficult to solve. If it's, if it's operating at something that says, well, up here I understand the science, and if I could just modify this a little bit, then I can get a breakthrough, that's, that's one level of difficulty. When you take things down to their most fundamental level and you say, you know, the reason this doesn't work is that you know, God just didn't create it to do that. Now, how do you want to deal with that? That's, that's a lot tougher. 
doesn't mean you, because of these interesting things that people are doing with genomics and hybrids and all, that you may not be able to fundamentally alter that, but how you, the pathway by which you get there is not as certain. Mm. And so it means it's probably further out there. It's hard to bet against science, though. And never bet against science. science. <laughs> <laughs> never. Because <laughs> you see an in by's lifetime. I mean, it's extraordinary what we've seen. It just in our lifetime. You know, the brain. The way we work today, uh, mm -hmm. I would never have dreamed in my company that we would be doing the things we're, I, we're doing. I'm, I stand in awe of my engineers and scientists and what they do mm -hmm. today that I never would have dreamed possible when I was a young engineer working. Imagine this for a moment. The President of the United States calls you and says, uh, Rex, I'd like for you to come down to the White House and let's have a conversation. Um, these are tough times for me and I'm trying to do the best I can. You know energy as well as anybody knows energy. I'm beginning a new administration here. I've got a new energy secretary. Uh, the world is a tough place in the neighborhoods in this world that are really tough. And, and I need you to help me tell me in terms of energy, which is vital. Bill Gates says it's the number one concern mm -hmm. he has, and he's involved in lots of things. What do we need to do? You would say to him what? Well, I think we need to agree on our national priorities around energy. Uh, try and frame that in a way that it informs us, the people that are in that business, but not just us that are in the fossil fuel business, but it informs others who are pursuing other forms of energy and, and map a way forward that allows in my view, allows the market forces to come to bear on how those options and alternatives are sorted through and advanced. Much of what's been done to this point has been a, an enormous amount of interference with that process of discovery and perfection and improvement. And it's been by well-intended people. And I appreciate that it's been by well-intended people who want to promote the advancement of alternative energy sources. But in, in the kinds of programs that have been put in place that involve mandates and enormous incentives, um, in effect price controls on how it, the energy offtake occurs from wind power and solar power, that I've always expressed to people that what you have really done is you have shackled the innovative process because what drives innovation in many respects is failure. That I'm that close, if I could just get it, if I could just overcome this, I've got the winner. And so when, when it is succeeding for false reasons, mm -hmm. it's succeeding because it doesn't have a competitor, it's succeeding because it is so incentivized, what we've really done is slowed down the process of innovation and breakthrough. I think there are enormous challenges around these alternatives which need to be dealt with. And so I think it's more a question of how, how does the U.S. government want to support and promote the research, the research activities that are necessary to take these forms of energy to a different level of performance, and whether that's you know, battery technology mm -hmm. or whether it's uh, efficiencies of wind or whether it's transmission systems that behave in different ways. Uh, how do you want to supply the underlying research but then allow the commercial activities up here to move about in the free market? So you're saying you want to see government plant more seed money in terms of an investment in, in term of the alternative possibilities. And there are good models for this. There are good models in the national labs. There are great models through DARPA. There are, there are models out there that have served us well. You gave us the internet. We've got, we just, we have so, uh, we have so much intervention right now in these energy markets that in my view it's not been healthy for the advancement of those alternatives. So you're saying less regulation and more, uh, well, less, more less, research? more fundamental research, less mandates. Uh, I, I mean, wind has received subsidies for more than 20 years now. Maybe if we took the subsidy off and it was challenged to have to perform, people would take it to a new level. Uh, they haven't had to. They haven't had to. So 
I think a lot of this is how do you want to structure our pursuit of our future energy supplies? And, that may, and the president has said he is a proponent of all of the above, and we are too. We are too. That's a very sensible strategy. And how do you want to use the things that are very sure and we know how to use them? Use them better. Use oil better. Use gasoline, diesel. Use all that stuff better. And there are things we yet can do while you're pursuing, though, that next generation that is everyone's vision. Mm -hmm. How do you want to lay the roadmap out to do that and put the roadmap in place so that it survives you, Mr. President? Because none of your predecessors have been successful at doing that. Have you had this conversation with him? Uh, I've had parts of that conversation with him, and I've had it with others. No. So you think he has a listening ear that he wants to hear what you have to say? He has a lot of people speaking into that ear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Charlie. Rex Tilson, the CEO of ExxonMobil, the largest company in the world in terms of market capitalization. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.